start clicking. Okay, don't worry about that. That's that's happening remotely. Uh, so we've got a command center downstairs who are all. Yeah, I don't. We'll try to find a way to cut out all the. Every recording is going to have some nonsense at the beginning and the end. Eleven oh two. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's always going to be. Yeah. You know, yeah. there's no telling how many will be in here oh, yeah. <laughs> online. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, whenever you're ready, really. Um, I'll shut the door. So, 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 attending on Zoom and thanks to our in-person people. So I think I'll start us off. Um, and this is our being set up here. This is our presentation on incorporating secondary traumatic stress education um, and support into the curriculum. This is work that we've been doing in the social work program. Um, and for purposes of today, we're trying to kind of um, streamline that into what might be beneficial to other disciplines as well. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about um, kind of introducing the concept of secondary traumatic stress and then move into um, what that might mean for disciplines in general, and, and then kind of talk specifically about what we've done in social work. So just a little um, starting point uh, around what is secondary traumatic stress for those that might not know. Um, so the emotional dress that results when an individual hears about the firsthand trauma uh, experiences of another. Um, so we obviously are seeing that a fair amount in social work with our students and, um, and so our, our research is around um, kind of uh, first uh, making students aware of what that is before they go out into specifically internship um, placements and then while they are in internship placements supporting them if they may experience um, secondary traumatic stress. So um, the natural uh, behaviors and emotions resulting from knowing about a traumatizing event from a significant other and the stress from helping or wanting to help that traumatized or stressed person. So um, kind of an old quote there, but still applicable today. Um, so that's just kind of an introduction into what secondary traumatic stress is. Um, so the kind of the uh, many reasons to be looking at this, but there's been a lot of talk in the field of social work in particular and in other helping professions around the concept of burnout. So that's kind of an older idea. Um, I remember when I was going into social work in the 90s, there was a lot of talk around the risk of social workers kind of burning out and um, either you know, not staying in a position that they were in or leaving the field of social work altogether. Um, but the concept of like what is causing that burnout um, around things like secondary traumatic stress is a more recent thing. So kind of paying attention to um, not just, just the fact that people are burning out, but the fact um, kind of some of those concepts around why they might be burning out. Um, so what can happen is if these experiences of, of secondary traumatic stress um, kind of go untreated or unrecognized over time, that is what leads to burnout. And that is what leads to people leaving their professions um, just not having the energy or the ability to stick with that profession um, and burning out, uh, quite frankly, in their professional and personal lives. Um, so an older quote there for sure on what burnout is, like that set, like I said, that's a concept that's been around for a while, um, but we want to know why that is happening and prevent that from happening and dealing with kind of what those experiences of secondary traumatic stress are before we get to that place of burnout. So why is this important to education? Why is it um, important to be paying attention to in terms of talking about it, um, addressing it, and then supporting?
supporting our students. Um, so first, from the student perspective, um, and this is the piece where we're trying to you know, make this kind of understandable and, and important to, to all disciplines to not just social work, but for students, it's really important, like you said, to have that awareness. So really catching students in this kind of pre-professional state, the, um, you know, kind of educating them around what secondary traumatic stress is, what it looks like, um, some of the behaviors, um, you know, emotions, um, experiences that they might be having to pay attention to. Um, and then, like I said, the next step would be going out that us as professionals be able to, um, or as educators, be able to support them as they, as they may experience some of those things. So back to the students, kind of that awareness, um, really paying attention. So a huge risk of experiencing secondary traumatic stress is having your own personal trauma in your background, in your history, um, which in social work the data shows that a lot of social work students do have a personal history of trauma. Um, and that you know, may be true for students in other disciplines as well. Um, so also having that awareness of what some of the risk factors are, additional risk factors of experiencing secondary traumatic stress, um, and then preparing them in that pre-professional state. Um, for faculty, um, what's important for faculty is the ability to recognize that vulnerability that students have. Um, keeping our classrooms a safe space for them to not only learn about this, but also to talk and process through when they might be having some um, indicators of secondary traumatic stress show up. Um, normalizing it, so making um, students aware that you know this is not something that's just unique to them, that's something that's very common that happens in healthy professions. Um, and also addressing that psychological shattering of one's own worldview. So that kind of speaks to oftentimes students in the classroom are kind of protected around what is really happening out there in the real world. And then they get to this place of going out into internships and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm actually experiencing this and hearing about all these things that maybe I've learned about in class, but now it's in, it's in real time and it's with real people. And that can really, um, Kind of shatter students' perspective around what's really out there, what the work is really going to look like. Um, and so it's really important for faculty to kind of step in and process through that with students and support them as they kind of understand that. Um, and so then how, why is this important to be talking about at the institutional level? So the influence that secondary traumatic stress have and, and students experiencing that on retention. Um, so our, our ability to keep our students in our programs when they start you know, in a health and professions program and when they start experiencing these things, we don't want that to deter them from continuing on with their education. We want to be able to work through things and, um, and support them through that. Also, just the influence of the importance of, you know, IPD and, and collaboration between the disciplines. So different disciplines are understanding the perspective of what's happening for a particular student in a particular program and how we can work together to support um, students no matter their, um, their program. And then also just the diversity of, of needs that students might have on campus. So that kind of goes back to kind of, you know, that influence of personal trauma for some students in particular um, and whatever the dynamics, you know, if they're a first generational student, you know, what that those dynamics might um, look like for them. So not only are they having their worldview shattered, they're um, kind of experiencing symptoms of secondary traumatic stress, and they also don't have you know, the benefit of having you know, family members that have kind of worked through those things you know, at the college level themselves. So, um, so just supporting that diversity of needs that students might have um, in their own individual experiences. Anything to add on any of those? Okay. <laughs> so, do you want me to switch yeah. with you now? Okay, yeah. all right. Um, because we've got this whole okay. zooming thing going. So, <laughs> so I think uh, you know Carrie is going to talk about a little bit. But one of the things that we were really interested in, we all come from working um, in the social work field. But before uh, Joni does the coordinating for field placements in Traverse City, Carrie was the field director here in Big Rapids for a long time, and now as she transitioned to a new role, I'm the field director. And so we were seeing and hearing some concerns around students 
And we were really looking at the program and its faculty to how we can prepare and support students and their placements and also meet the needs of our community partners. And then COVID happened. <laughs> Yay, because uh, we have not talked enough about that. So what would a presentation be without talking about the impact of COVID? But really, we were already seeing some challenges around secondary track stress, which is a little bit normal in terms of when students go into the field and some of the things that they experience. But then we added on all these extra layers of challenges that students were experiencing. So we came at it from a social work perspective and Corey will talk about some of the research that we're doing really from a relationship building, sort of this relational pedagogy kind of approach of how do we meet students where they're at, how do we support them, and frankly, how do we deal with our own stuff too while we're trying to do all of this. So COVID sort of exacerbated some of the challenges, sort of, right, just a little bit, it exacerbated some of the challenges that we were seeing, and we really wanted to be intentional in figuring out how we were going to connect with students. And doing that in a different way, right? We moved remote. It's really easy for social workers to talk to students. It's really easy for us to connect, but doing that in a different space and in a different way, we had to be really creative and innovative in figuring out how to connect with students and address some of the concerns that they were facing. So as I said, we weren't seeing students in this traditional physical face-to-face -face space. So how do we make those connections when we know students need that so much? during this time, but also recognizing how much we can give to, right? Because we're all kind of dealing with our own stuff too. So as Joni pointed out, we we're seeing a lot more burnout with our students and trying to address those concerns in a remote way can be really challenging. It's also creating new opportunities. So we wanted to, in response, do a review of our curriculum and kind of figure out if we are talking enough about secondary traumatic stress, if we're really, if it's showing up throughout our curriculum and how we are intentionally doing that. So we can kind of quantify and measure and see where our areas where we may not be doing that. So using this type of relational pedagogy, really looking at intentional connection and building relationships at multiple levels. So we'll talk a little bit about what faculty can do, what advisors can do. Um, and we'll have conversation opportunity for you guys too. And really the ultimate goal was to address and decrease the anxiety and stress that students were facing, again, which compounds all of these other issues. So using a relational pedagogy, really what we do is all relationship-based. So we're all social workers, so we're biased, <laughs> right? We think relationship is the catalyst to everything. change everything, <laughs> yes, everything. But really and truly so is education. If I don't have a good rapport relationship with my student, chances are they're not going to be as invested in the information that I'm sharing on a good day, right? And we exist as human beings through relationship. And that's how we learn and grow and transform, which is some of the goals that we have at our institution. And through these reciprocal relationships and interactions, we exchange information and knowledge. And that's really where deep learning occurs. So we think about it from a field perspective, that's where students are doing, right? The work that they had learned about in the books and in all of our classroom discussions, and then they're going out and doing those things. So we want to figure out how we could support that. So through using relational pedagogy, the goal is to create the space, right? And being creative in the space that we're using. So to create and use space to develop a trusting relationship between a teacher and a student and to be accessible and to engage in um, a, a new level of participation so that that learning process can grow and that it's not funded just because we're online or in other ways. Oh, so much social work stuff here, right? So just <laughs> scream social work. So the key concept of relational pedagogy, which is probably why we're a little bit biased around this is because it's all about building empathy appreciating where people are coming from and trust and building that relationship and respect. And we like to talk to social workers. So, right, all about increasing communication, but building some inclusivity. You know, I was talking to some of our colleagues and it was really hard when we were teaching online sometimes. We would watch students decompensate week after week. They were struggling with things. They were getting sick. We had our own stuff going on. People in our family were getting sick. 
they were constantly adjusting to issues of internship. They were out of pause, they were fully remote, they were in the thing, but there's a lot going on. So just recognizing that even though we have some common experiences that we're all sharing, that everybody has their own stuff, and we might not know what that is. So everyone is unique in what they're bringing to, to the table. And just wanting to genuinely connect and care for students again, and, and doing that in a little bit of a different way, maybe than we did intentionally when before the pandemic. So as faculty, some of the things that we can do is model these things, right? Our actions really motivate students. So if we can show up and how we're showing up and that we're attending to their needs, that just allows them the space to be able to learn and learn at a deeper level. There's research that shows that the relationship is a predictor of improved student outcomes as on a surprise for our social workers. As the relationship is everything. As um, Carrie says, we need to acknowledge that there's multiple layers of challenges and thinking about that from different perspectives. So especially for marginalized or oppressed students, persons of color, there's some additional challenges that, that may be going on for them too. And so really thinking about those and to try as best as possible to remain student focused in our interactions. And so creating the space to just take a 10 minute break and say, you know what, I know we have all this content that we need to get to, but we need to just first check in, right? How are you doing? And not like, oh, good, right? Like when I see you guys in the hall, how are you doing? Oh, right, thanks for coming, right? Like really, how are you doing? And allow for that space to be able to have those conversations. The more we can normalize those things, there's some power in that, I think. As advisors, you know, our advisors, uh, really do increase your retention. They provide supports and they really help students to gain confidence and knowledge and help them navigate things. During the pandemic specifically, um, I was talking to a colleague and she used this term academic stamina. I was like, oh yeah, that's really good. There was such a lower amount of academic stamina, this bandwidth, I just couldn't handle anymore. So we were talking about some of the things we were seeing at our institution couple of my, my colleagues at different institutions and just navigating things that our students are really well versed at doing. Making an advising appointment, dealing with financial aid. I shouldn't say like that. Talking with financial aid, you know, <laughs> and doing all those things. It was like they'd done this before, but they just couldn't seem to put all the pieces together because their bandwidth was just too much, right? So from an advisor's perspective, from faculty perspective, really sitting there and talking with students and helping them to figure out kind of how to navigate some of those things. And then we're asking them to develop, we're asking them to be in the field and to perform as a, as a budding social worker, um, and then to go out in the field and to meet these challenges. And that's a kind of daunting task on a good day, but certainly during some of these times, it's an even more daunting task. So again, relationships, that could have been the key title here, right? Um, and, and the fact that we can connect students um, to the resources that they might need. So for us, we found that checking in multiple ways, offering different levels of support, whether that's a quick Zoom meeting, a quick phone call, and we have professors who would text with, you know, their, their students having longer open office hours. Just sending a follow-up email, like, how is it going? I know you had a really rough day or things that were going on. Not being uncomfortable and having uncomfortable conversations. So noticing and calling it out that there seems to be some things going on. So what can we do to talk about those? And acknowledging and validating that things are hard and just providing the space to have a conversation about those challenges. So we could probably spend an entire um, hour talking about the challenges and opportunities to check in on online platforms. Some of those things worked well, we found out kind of what didn't, we adjusted, but really wanting to acknowledge that in addition to just some kind of normal levels of um, exposure to trauma and secondary traumatic stress, there's other things that are going on too, and to be aware of that for our students as well as ourselves. So social work is 
I, I think a little bit unique in that in our program, in our BSW program, our bachelor's program, we offer two internships. We require two internships. And the first internship usually happens in like the student's third semester, um, their freshman summer um, experience. And that's 120 hours of, of just being in an agency, being near social workers, um, being, you know, working with um, different clients that come in, just having some exposure, um, just some overall, you know, can, am I comfortable talking um, with these folks? Um, is this kind of what I anticipated social workers to do? And so um, it's, a, it's an eye-opening experience for many, many students. And it, for a lot of students, and I teach the, the 170 class, and I tell them, I said, we want this experience to be something where you're either all in, like I'm super excited about social work, this is exactly what I was thinking, well, maybe it's not exactly, but I love it, I'm invested, I wanna do this, I'm excited about it. Or we have some students that are like, this is not anything, what I thought this was gonna be like, um, but you know what, I'm only three semesters in, <laughs> and I can still take a different route, you know, and that's okay too, that, that's why that's here. And so um, our internships, I mean, students start out our program knowing that internships are, are a big deal because they're in it so quickly. Um, our second internship is 240 hours, it's their senior field placement. It's over the course of two semesters. It's usually their last two semesters that they're in our program. So students are able to take that freshman internship, lots of curriculum in between, right? About two years of curriculum, then get into their senior field placement. Um, and so our students spend just a lot of time in internships. And so we really felt like that was a good place for us as faculty to focus and hopefully be able to measure because we kind of had that starting point at the beginning of our, of our program um, and at the end and kind of see how are students feeling about this? Is, is the, the, the secondary traumatic stress, is the, are the feelings of, of being, being overwhelmed? Um, is it manageable? Do they think we did a good job? In preparing them for the field. And I can say that, you know, this this has been talked about in social work, right? Joni and I and James too, we've all been in the field for the last 20 years. Um, it, secondary traumatic stress, burnout, um, all of those things have been talked about for a really long time in our field. I think I can pretty confidently say that other fields probably haven't focused as much time on this. Um, I do some IPE stuff with folks in pharmacy and optometry and nursing. And I, I'm not saying they don't touch on it, but I don't think they put probably as much focus just as a profession on it. Again, I guess COVID has put more of a finer point on this, right? Between um, burnout in the health, the medical field, burnout for teachers um, in the educational field. Um, if you are in a helping profession and you are um, regularly exposed to some people who are in obviously very difficult situations, you take all this stuff in, okay? And so I feel like our field, just in, our profession in general, for the last 20 years has really tried to put a finer point on this because we wanna retain our workers. Because those workers are working with folks who um, are marginally, or, you know, are marginalized, are um, at risk populations. Um, we want to maintain a, a good, healthy field of social workers um, who are working with these folks. And so, again, I think this could be used, again, in our, our CJ program, right? Um, that's another field where um, people, I do feel like for the, the vast majority of the, the students that come into that program, I want to help people, mm -hmm. right? They, they maybe have experienced something in their own life that has led them to wanting to help people. And so um, I think that this is something that maybe, you know, their field is coming around to a little bit acknowledging, um, but there is a lot of stigma, right, too, about um, admitting that these uh, these stories are impacting me, um, admitting that this might be impacting my job, and um, admitting that this might be impacting what I take home to my family, right, the stories that I hear and how is that impacting what I take home. So, yeah, so it, it, again, this is in social work, but it could be used in a lot of different areas here on campus <laughs> and agencies that we work with. So, so we really, we've been in the kind of this research mode oh, about two years now. You know, first was really developing, just we talked about the idea that great speaker this morning, because it really, I think it, um, 
It did a lot of percolating. We we talked about this for a long time. Like, are we doing uh, in our program what we what we want to be doing? Um, is does it somehow mirror what they're doing in the field as far as education, monitoring, providing support, that sort of a thing? Um, so we kind of right at this point, <laughs> we've settled on kind of two different areas that we're really looking at. Um, last year, we had a student go through all of our syllabi in the VSW program, and he looked for key terms. Um, specifically secondary traumatic stress, information, signs, symptoms, prevention of. Um, he was looking for those um, lectures, assignments, things that had to do specifically with self-care, the importance of it, um, anything along those lines. Okay, So he kind of did a whole um, syllabi overview of the, the whole program and what we have written down. The other piece that we're doing right now, we survey faculty and then we're surveying students. So students who are in what, what we, is our social work 370 class, which is pre-senior internship. And then also surveying students when they're done with their senior internship, okay? So that's our social work 482. So um, we surveyed faculty regarding how often are they talking about secondary traumatic stress when they um, are monitoring that student's field experience. Um, we ask them how prepared they feel students are when they enter the field um, and then during their internship experience and then how supported they think students are during the internship just as a whole. Like how, how, how does um, the faculty see this whole field internship um, playing out, okay? And again, two different student surveys. Um, regarding student attitudes, um, preparedness prior to entering the internship, and then just their overall sense of support um, as they're finishing up their internship. Okay. On the last slide, I think I forgot to mention it. So when the students are in an internship, they have a field seminar instructor, which we meet once a week um, and provide supervision, but then also some professionalism stuff and problem solving, things like that. Um, and then they also have a liaison that goes to the agency, of course, now we're zooming, but um, that is that connection between the, the student, um, um, Ferris, and the agency themselves. So I always tell students, they're nervous about going into the field, but I always tell them, like, you will never have as much oversight and support um, once you graduate, right? This is the time. Like, we talk about new ideas, trying new things. This is the time you will have a ton of supervision, you'll have a lot of people that you can go to. Um, but we want to see, you know, we wanted to know, do students, are they feeling that? Um, because even though we feel that like we put these safety nets in place, um, sometimes obviously students maybe aren't, aren't using those safety nets or they don't feel as though um, that they can or, you know, the fact that they aren't as approachable or the agency isn't as approachable, so. So in our syllabi review, um, our student looked again, looked specifically for words of secondary traumatic stress, trauma, and then any other psychological symptoms as related to like you know, depression, anxiety, anything, um, any, um, um, sorry, assignments that have to do specifically with monitoring a student's just overall um, symptoms and then self-care, okay? Um, as you can see, we had 21 syllabi reviewed. It's not in our syllabi. Not as much as what we would like to see. And I can honestly, at every stinking curriculum meeting, <laughs> we talk about this, right? We talk about the importance, and I know that it's happening in our classroom. Um, because when you say the word, students know what we're talking about, okay? Um, I teach two 100 level courses right now. And I mean, I'm talking about it with students already. They, they know, they don't understand it fully, obviously, but they hear the words, okay? But it's not reflected in our curriculum paperwork, right? I mean, does anybody coming in, looking at it, they're like, do they even talk about this or not, you know? And so um, we do talk a lot about self-care um, and students kind of roll their eyes, you know, especially when they get to like the 300, 400 level classes because they're like self-care, you know? Um, <laughs> We try and, and get students to understand that self-care is not just, you know, a bubble bath on Wednesday nights. It's, it's much, much more than that. Um, and so trying to work that information in, again, you know, just, just talking about in the 100 level, building upon it throughout the curriculum. 
But um, our takeaways as faculty is like, okay, we talk about this all the time, but it is not well reflected in our syllabi. And so, you know, we're gonna, we plan to take this back to our, our um, curriculum committee and try and figure out ways to scaffold that information in, in ways that is appropriate at a 100 level, 200 level, 300 level, 400 level courses, and um, specific, you know, to assignments. I think a lot of it is, um, again, just defining it, um, but also noting, I mean, I don't necessarily have every lecture topic in a syllabi, you know what I mean? But it, it should be, right? Because if we're gonna monitor it well, then that it needs to be, it needs to be in that paperwork. Um, we already, like I said, we already really educate students early. But again, going back to that scaffolding, because at 100 level, they are just not there yet, right? Their maturity is not there yet. They have, um, they're just starting out at, at an internship. Um, they're just not quite there yet. Um, but then figure out how to build upon that. Um, and I mentioned our goal as faculty, as a faculty document reflected, and I, I would say that the answer is no. So I was really shocked at these um, results. For as much as we talk about this, yeah, a lot. I am shocked yeah. at, at the actual results of that. So I won't go through all of the, the survey questions. I just pulled out some interesting ones. Um, for the faculty survey results, we only had five VSW faculty complete the survey, but because the three of us couldn't do it, <laughs> That's something a lot of our, about, that you know what I mean? Like that that is most of our, our other BSW faculty who are full time in the BSW program. So um, one of the questions on that survey was in considering formal um, content related to secondary traumatic stress, on average, how much time, if any, throughout the semester do you spend on the topic? Please answer this question as the total number of minutes you spend in the course um, you teach for each semester. So Three faculty indicated um, one to 60 minutes. You know, and I figured that's about a, a course, right? One lecture, probably. Um, one lecture-ish, okay? Um, one faculty indicated 121 to 180 minutes, and then one faculty indicates 181 to 240 minutes. So overall, I don't know that that was super shocking. Um, I think that that's probably, I mean, if you look over the course of our semester, the classes that are taught, that's, I mean, students are getting it actually quite a bit. Right, they're, they're hearing the information, not well reflected in the syllabi, but it, they are hearing the information. Um, another interesting question, I believe students are well prepared to begin their senior internship, and just remember this is faculty who are, are answering this. So five agree, and then one did not answer. So that's what we got. Um, I believe the DSW curriculum provides adequate information on, on secondary traumatic stress. And so four agree and one strongly agree, I think that comes from the constant conversations that we're having in the program and from the constant conversations that they're having in our profession. You know, this is just, I mean, if you are in social work, you hear a lot about this. Again, agencies have had to take a, a huge role in this because they want to retain um, um, staff, right? They are, they have put a huge focus on this in the last 10, 15 years because the constant turnover is not good for agencies, it's not good for our clients. And so, um, like I said, I feel like um, our, our faculty are like, yeah, we do a good job, but again, just not reflected well. And not scaffolded well, I would say. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna add quick exactly. on the agency side of things. I think agencies are really having to revamp how they're looking at this and, and what they're doing because of COVID, because we're seeing right. just a historical amount of turnover in, I mean, a lot of the helping professions, but for us looking at social work, I mean, the state of Michigan and our child welfare programs, it's just, I mean, they can't keep staff. So um, so it's really significant and how COVID is gonna play in. I mean, speaking with innovative ideas, like how, you know, how the workforce is gonna handle, um, you know, not only secondary traumatic stress, but now the COVID influence on, on that and other things. So I sit on a um, statewide, um, Council that pulls in the Department of Health and Human Services in um, many of our Michigan universities. So um, Michigan State's on there, Michigan, Eastern, Wayne, CMU, uh, Cornerstone is on there, a lot of our, our main uh, Michigan universities. And we, we offer what's called a child welfare certificate. Okay, so, so for students who are going into specific child welfare jobs, that, I mean, we have quite a few students that say, I want to do foster care. I want to do adoption. 
I want to do child protective services. Um, I want to work in that in that realm. And so for those students, they can get what's called the child welfare certificate, Dana teaches the classes. Um, I sit on this advisory council. So some of the feedback that we're getting from the state is actually they don't hire very many social work um, majors. They are hiring um, criminal justice um, um, psych because that is uh, the state does not have the requirement of having a social work degree. A lot of our social work students are going on for MSWs and doing more clinical work. And so, which begs to you know the the question of okay, we can do the the secondary traumatic stress. Um, spiel, right, in social work, but one of the highest um, burnout agencies that we have is working for the state, mm -hmm. right, and we're not reaching them, <laughs> yeah. which would be like our CJ and like, yeah. and you know what I mean, human services degree, or even whatever. though we have the child work certificate, even though we have the certificate, right, well, and I just can't say, as a going into those agencies, a lot of times, they do go on for their MSW, or they look at it, and they say, wow, that's a lot and I'm really grateful that I had that 480 hour right. experience but that's a lot right mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah. so just a little yeah. side note um so social work 370 so these students are uh the 370 class is a one credit class that preps students for their internship so resumes and cover letters and talking about professionalism and expectations of the internship and all that so we had 27 total participants um, again, just some interesting questions. So one of the questions, um, how knowledgeable are you on the topic of secondary traumatic stress? Um, on a scale of one to 10, um, the average answer was a seven. Okay, so they feel as though they're pretty knowledgeable before they enter the field, right? Like, okay, I kind of get it. I kind of know what the, what the signs and symptoms are. And then five students for the end chose that answer. Um, how well do you think you will cope with secondary trauma, if any, that you encountered during your senior internship. So I put all of the possible answers just so that you could kind of see the spectrum, the, the, the different ways that they could have answered. Um, you know, nine students uh, reported that they were, um, they felt as though they coped very well. Um, 14 monitor, moder moderately well, three slightly well, right? And then just one is unsure. And then um, we did put on there, I don't anticipate encountering any, nobody. Nobody indicated that. Oh, I thought that was a comment. No, I was like, oh, no, no that was one of the. That was one of the <laughs> no, but that I mean, I I do think that that is relative. I mean, as a student going into an internship, not really knowing what to expect, I, those answers I think are pretty, um, on oh, you know, on top. Yeah, yeah, I do too. So this is. Um, our answers from Social Work 482, which again is the second semester of their internship. Both semesters are in their same agency. Okay, so this is like two semesters worth of one agency. Um, we only had five participants that semester. It ebbs and flows with the number of, of students in, in their senior placements. But um, please select the level of agreement that best corresponds with the following statement. I encountered more feelings of secondary trauma during my senior internship than I anticipated. Um, one agreed, one disagreed, and two said that they did not experience trauma, which I thought was very surprising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would question that, mm -hmm. which, um, because I don't know the agency um, that we place a student at where there is not a significant, potential. well, for sure, Somebody potential, potential. Right? Yeah. for traumatic reaction of some kind. Which makes me think, like, do they not? Did they not get it? <laughs> right. Like, were they not aware of the the reaction in themselves? Were they not aware of? Um, I don't know. That was troubling to me because you would think that they would at least be the you know somewhat disagree disagree. I mean, if they just didn't mm -hmm. um, experience you know any significant. But I don't know. That was a little bit. But I feel like our our overall obviously you know with only four having responded. That's not huge, right? So I don't know about that one. Can I ask a really quick question? You bet. Were these face-to-face -face internships or were these internships that were being done like tele remote sort of contacts with people with COVID? Um, I think it was a mix. It was a mix. Yeah. yeah. So this would have been yeah. from last year. Yeah. So they were our first, like, well, not our first, our yeah. first full year yeah. of kind of dealing with students in internship and, and COVID. So 
That's it really would have been a mix point. at that point. We really struggled with internships when, you know, spring 2020, it's like, okay, suddenly we're doing all remote work. Yeah. All, just, everyone yeah. pivoted that right. semester. But right. last year when we would have been doing these surveys, there would have been a mix at that point. I think most of our agencies at that point were at a mix too. You know, they're yeah. trying to do as much But you're right in that those that were remote, their experiences, and even those that were in, in person, their experiences were different because of right. their accessibility to clients and all of those factors that came into play. And there were a lot of agencies that, and, and even today still, you know, um, so you can only have 20% of your workforce on site at this time, which then, you know, also impacts what they might have been hearing from their, you know, other colleagues, yeah. from more families coming in or people accessing services. So um, there was a lot of differences in internships even today, you know, with COVID, but certainly at this time, right? Yeah. Um, did I get this right? No. Nope. So please select the level of agreement that best corresponds with the following statement. I received the support I needed throughout my internship. And again, this relates to seminar instructor liaison and then also at the agency because they do have a supervisor at the agency as well. Um, so one student strongly agreed, two agreed, and then one somewhat agreed. Um, and so I would say that's pretty overall, I mean, pretty positive overall. Um, obviously, we'd like to have them all be strongly agreed, right? Um, lots of moving parts with internships with so many people kind of in the mix. We've talked about this as a, cur or as a curriculum um, committee before. Historically, our program has always had a liaison and a seminar instructor that were two separate faculty. And the reasoning was it's nice to have another pair of eyes on that, right? Otherwise, you, one person is kind of responsible for that back and forth. They're responsible for the, the vast majority of all grading and all of that stuff. But again, the, the flip side of that is having an, another person in the mix is another person um, to potentially cause some confusion over like, who do I go to first? What do I share with this person? Um, oh, I thought you were going to do it. <laughs> you mean, I thought you were going to have to meet, you know, that sort of a thing. And so there are both sides. I mean, there are, are definite drawbacks to having another person in the mix. But I do think students know, as with any program, they gravitate towards um, certain faculty, and it's kind of nice that they have an option if they are struggling in an internship specifically to go to somebody else, right? To have that another another set of eyes on the issue. That, is that just our references are yeah, here so for anyone that knows so it? Any questions or anything? Oh, one is a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> one, I just was going to say one of the things that we hope to continue. Obviously, we hope to continue surveying students. We need to pull our, our curriculum committee into this now and say, okay, this is what we've got. And we had a little hiccup because, doggone it, Dana graduated with her DSW and we lost our fall tricks. So um, we had to make that swap. Um, we had to get the, the license that we needed from Question Pro and all that stuff. So we had a little hiccup there, but I, and then obviously COVID stuff. So it's like, do we put that, those results in there? How strongly do we, you know what I mean? How, how much weight do we put on um, students' responses in regards to this specific issue during the whole COVID thing, right? Um, but the other piece of it is we also do an exit survey, an exit interview. And so having kind of the, um, the, the numbers to support, but also we can do lots of interviews, right? Quantitative, qualitative stuff and compare those two, I think would be helpful, but maybe adding that as an interview as part of the project so that we have some numbers, but we also have some, just um, some good student feedback as well. Um, we talked about doing this in our freshman internship too. Yes. So again, kind of surveying students at a 170, which is that pre, uh, freshman year internship orientation class and then post that 120 hours, how did they feel in terms of preparedness and then support um, and also extending the survey to our agency partners. So getting a different perspective from supervisors to see how prepared do they feel our students are coming in as allies to this? How did they feel in terms of support and, and just kind of getting a, a little bit more of a holistic perspective on different data points we discussed even tweaking this in parameters of the program and taking a look at those things, but we're going to 
Yes, maybe mm -hmm. focus on that first. Mm -hmm. Oh, and now we're super inspired by our speakers. Yeah, we're innovating. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what questions do I, I don't necessarily have questions, but just a bunch of things, you know, running through my head, and I can see where taking this type of information to um, educators, you know, School of Education, mm -hmm. addressing things like this with their students. Um, so Trinity, I was just telling these guys, I was walking down the hall in STARS the other day, and um, um, someone from um, Lisa was uh -huh. um, presented, had a class. Yeah. And so I walked past the first door, and I thought it was her, and then the second door, you can see the the PowerPoint uh -huh. and it was trauma in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, so like, oh, like, we need to do that. You know what I mean? Like we've we've reached out to nursing and yeah. Well, the schools, yeah. I mean, even before COVID, there's such a huge push for schools to become trauma informed right now, right. just with how they're looking at you know K-12 students and the whole student and paying attention to things. And now add in COVID and everyone recognizing the significance of the mental health needs as we kind of come back into the classroom and, you know, our mm -hmm. Zooms and everything. And, you know, I, I think there's just this, you know, wonderful push to have more mental health support in the school systems as we kind of move through speaking of ideas and innovation and all that good stuff. So the, the IPE opportunities between like, you know, mm -hmm. social work and other helping professions with education is just booming right now. CJ, it's CJ. a really good time for us. I think it's important for us to take what you guys have learned and apply it to um, the college students that we are mm -hmm. recruiting today. Yeah. Um, there's so much out there in higher education talking about um, mental health services for students and the need for it, and it's growing, it's busting at the seams, and that's a variety of things from you know losing the stigma of it to things that are happening with COVID and then just life in the middle of all of it and I, I can't help but think that some of this would be beneficial for our instructors and faculty as well because they deal with these students um, so much and one of the things oh, I was just reading the other day and it was talking about you know ways of really helping students and and um, it, it gave a percentage of students that participated in this um, uh, what am I thinking of? <laughs> Survey, right? Okay. Um, and the percentage of students that had experienced a level of trauma that they self-identified um, is growing. And the, the students that we as Ferris are hoping to, you know, um, come to our school to help them, to help educate them, are part of a population that is experiencing a high level of trauma. Mm -hmm. And so the more our faculty know and can identify that mm -hmm. and help them understand that we don't think you need to help the student, but we know where you can go and how to identify that. I think it is important um, as well as um, maybe even more so, and this is not to say anything um, you know, uh, bad about people in these fields, but some of the less human, less, sure. you know, yeah. uh, empathetic fields, um, you know, and those are the classes that most students struggle in, and a ton of first generation yeah. um, and minority students struggle in the sciences and math, and I can't help but think that a little bit of, you know, attention um, in that area and helping uh, folks understand that it's okay that you can help them but know what it is right and where to go that that would be helpful as um, well i think that's well, really I, important i think the other thing is as k-12 is responding to these needs we need to be doing that too right yeah. because that's the right they're going to come from schools they're going to come here what is Ferris going to do yep. to help support me and if we're not keeping pace with that if we're not on top of that if we don't have an answer you know speaking to your retention to your recruiting yep. to all those things how can we be the space for them to come and feel as much or even more support right. well right. i mean i had i had a really interesting conversation with sonia Trevino, i think that's how uh -huh. you pronounce mm -hmm. our new professional advisor in, in paint and um so when she was first arriving here and I was talking mm -hmm. about just kind of advising and you know keeping in mind the diversity of our student needs and first gen and all that and in my role as an advisor I I try to come from a place of empowering students like mm -hmm. here are the things 
that you need to do. And here is like the steps to do that. And she was like, oh, that's great. And not that empowerment is a bad thing, but she was like, I'm coming from this place in Texas where like the students I work with, like they face one barrier and they're done. Like it's too much. Like it's just like, I don't know how to move forward with financial aid. So I guess I'm not okay. meant to be a college student. And that's it kind of thing. And I was like, that's really important for me to keep in mind as we do this dance around empowerment versus support versus whatever that looks like. And so I just think it was just like one of those, I had like an aha moment myself, mm -hmm. which is like just speaking to the importance of just this collaboration amongst disciplines and learning from each other and what works. And um, so, yeah, I think it's just, it's really, you know, when we start looking at first gen needs and, you know, the diversity of needs of students and retention and all that, this is key stuff in my mind. Mm -hmm. so, and thinking yeah. about even just from that stamina piece, like my yeah. colleagues and I were talking about just like, we are overloaded right now with yeah. a lot of things. And so figuring out how we can be creative and helping faculty and advising and all those things to meet those needs, but also recognizing that just because they students hit one bump there doesn't mean that they are failures or yeah. that they're but that they're to give up, but then just really thinking about it from a piece of bandwidth and stamina and support. And I think the big thing too is encouraging again we have communication with each other yeah yeah you know mm -hmm. we do that all the time we're always balancing like okay are we enabling the student you know what yeah, i mean like, like we don't yeah. want to do that no. we want to prepare them we have a bar right yeah, <laughs> in our program like we can't just look mm -hmm. the other way because they're having a difficult semester you know right. they still have to do the work but <laughs> how can we what can we do right. what what is right. what have other people tried what you know and and so i feel like in our program we do a pretty good job of my gosh joni what you know you know the student a little bit better what do i do you know what i mean like give me some and that part of that too is as a profession we do so much with supervision like i am used to going to other social workers and saying all right i met with them yeah. i don't know what to do right. <laughs> am i you know what i mean am i am i enabling am i truly being helpful am i giving the student this client whatever what they what they need I'm used to that, and I think most of the people in our faculty are used to that and are open to that. Mm -hmm. And I can see where maybe other professions, they're just not as it's open. It's not part of that whole right. Exactly. Right. Right. It's right. not anybody's fault. Right. 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 They're right. not made that way. Right. Right. I mean, that's how we've worked in the field for 20 years. You know, right. so um, that's just is not a thing that we would even think twice about. But I think that that helps with our students because then, I mean, we, we can collaborate a little bit. Okay. You know, have you talked to the student? Have you reached out? Have you gotten a response back? What What do we do? You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. and and prioritizing things like assignments or, you know, I don't know. I just feel like we have that collaboration a little bit, maybe more. I don't know. I've never been in many programs, but um, our profession is oriented. In it is. Way, for it sure. is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you have a lot to share, and I hope we can figure out a way to abuse your talent. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> in a good way. Right. Yeah, in a good way. Yeah. yeah. No, we're excited about it, too. It's yeah. important stuff. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need to go to I thunder. Oh. <laughs> um, that's not conducive to anybody's mental health. Speaking of, I got this right before. It's like, is she alone? No, I don't think she's in. I will talk to you. <laughs> you will <laughs> talk I hate those unexpected um, snow days. You know, another thing that I found really interesting is that, you know, the the idea of secondary trauma has been I mean, not the idea, just the fact of it, and maybe we didn't have a name for it yet, you know, it's been around for eons, and it's as if the self-care is the answer to it without naming the problem, yeah, and now yeah. we're going back and like really identifying and naming that problem, yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. And I, I think also students when they think of the self care plan, and part of that is us. Like yeah. we, we do talk about like the the external things that you like the bubble bath and the time away, right? Like, but it's also an internal mindset. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I this is this is a boundary for me. I can't control this. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a mindset also because you're kind of guarding that way in yourself. So it's external stuff that you absolutely have mm -hmm. to, to participate in. But it's also just an internal thing that is, is developed over time. Right. You know what I mean? They're not going to get yeah. that in 100, 200. Right? I always tell students that too, like, this is stuff that I, I tell I check myself about all the time. You know, and so, um, yeah, but they, I mean, they just, they're not there yet. You know, and they're not there at 400 all the time either. Right. I mean, you know, it right takes a lifetime. Right. You know? And right. so many of your students have been involved in the system, and that's why they want to be involved. Yeah, so they're carrying their right. own stuff. And yeah. in stuff. order for them to help their clients, yeah. they're going to have to deal with that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and that's not easy. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, thank you guys for coming. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Nice to see you, Julie, in person. I'm sure you're gone. I don't know how they would have that. Yeah, because we're like literally here. Yeah.